Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. We are going to get started in just a moment. We are waiting for our guest, Simone Sanders. Um, as I'm sure you all can guess, her schedule can get quite frantic, but um, I think she'll be on in the next minute or so. Uh, I'm going to turn my camera off, but um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone um, was aware that we will be starting soon. So thank you for your patience. Hello. So Hi, sorry. How are you? How are you? How are oh, you? you know, just um, another tube. No, I, I totally understand. I just let the audience know that we'll be starting in just a second. Um, so I think we are ready to go. Okay. Okay. Hi, Simone. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. It's good to see you. Thank you oh, for taking you the me? time to do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the latest in Third Way's ongoing digital briefing series on how COVID-19 is upending our economy and our politics. As a reminder for participants on the call, we've got over uh, 200, I think almost 300 folks on this, uh, this call today. Um, no surprise given our guest. Uh, you can ask questions using the Q&A feature at any time and I'll try to get to as many of the questions as possible. I am so excited about today's guest. She doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll uh, make an attempt at a brief one anyway. Simone Sanders is currently serving as senior advisor to former Vice President Joe Biden's presidential campaign. During the 2016 presidential campaign, she became the youngest person at the age of 25 to become a national press secretary when she served on Bernie Sanders' campaign. She is a CNN contributor, has been a fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics, a lecturer at USC, and now the author of a brand new book, No, You Shut Up, Speaking Truth to Power and Reclaiming America. Simone, first of all, how are you? I am good. I'm sorry to keep everybody waiting. We are actively campaigning in this virtual world. <laughs> You know, I, I totally understand. So like a lot of folks who work in politics, I've been following your career. And as soon as the race came down to Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, I think I and a lot of people have been dying to get your take on so many things. But I'll just dive right in and start with last week. 
So Vice President Biden did the now viral interview on The Breakfast Club last week, and towards the end of the interview, made the comment that anyone who's deciding between him and Trump ain't Black. He's since apologized for the remarks, but that interview was really more about how Vice President Biden is communicating his agenda for Black America. And unfortunately, so much of what was discussed during the interview didn't get viral, but I want to talk about how you are thinking about the vice presidential, the vice president's black agenda, and how black voters are connecting with the message. Why do you think that there's a, a persistent feeling that the party and perhaps the campaign are taking black voters for granted? And how do you and the campaign plan to get out the message about the black agenda and ensure that it's connecting with voters who may not necessarily be thinking about voting for Trump, but maybe thinking about sitting out the election as they did in 2016? Well, thank you for the question. Look, I think what's most important, um, Vice President Biden spoke to this in that interview that he did on The Breakfast Club with Charlemagne the God last Friday. And Charlemagne specifically asked the Vice President, I believe Charlemagne has been spoken about this um, in comments that he's made since the interview aired, but Charlemagne asked the Vice President, do you think, um, do you understand why many African-American folks, many Black voters have felt like the Democratic Party has taken them for granted? And the Vice President said, absolutely. Yeah, I get it. I absolutely get it. And the reality is that, um, our campaign is not doing that. Our campaign nor the vice president have never taken the African-American vote for granted. Frankly, it was uh, black voters who propelled us to a primary victory in this election. And black voters will be critical to whether or not Vice President Biden captures the office of the, office of the presidency this fall. So we are making investments. You know, I, I don't know uh, how many folks on this call have seen, but we have been doing a number of path to victory presentations, if you will about what we see as our path to 270 and how we plan to get there and what coalition our campaign will have to put together to do that. In that very presentation that we've given to groups large and small, to the press, to our grassroots supporters, to donors, to uh, various uh, endorsers of ours, we have said that a key part of our coalition are young voters, are suburban voters, are women, are um, college educated voters, but also non-college educated voters, blue collar voters, African American men, Latino men, Obama Trump voters, also young people, and African American and Latino voters. We put that in our Path to Victory presentation, and so I think it is incumbent upon the campaign to make sure that we are um, taking the, the vision that Vice President Biden has laid forth and the very comprehensive plan that he has put together for the African American community forward and making sure that we are actively communicating that and, and working with partners to ensure that pieces of that get out there. So there's stuff that the campaign can do. But frankly, I've heard a number of folks in the media assert that, you know, Vice President Biden has to hear what folks are saying and we need to put out a plan. And to those people, I say we have put out a plan. Now we welcome your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. One of the, so two of the areas um, that have come up in terms of what Black voters are looking for, what Black, the constituency are looking for are, one, economic justice, and then a signal about, you know, who he chooses as his vice president. I really want to focus on the economic justice point because I think I saw this morning that the vice president is embracing an economic message. You know, 30 million plus Americans that are out of work in this, in the middle of this pandemic. Um, we, and even before the pandemic, Black unemployment was double that of white unemployment. And so can you just talk a little bit about drawing some, some of, the, of the planks from the plan that is out there? What is the economic justice plan, particularly as it pertains to Black America? Well, what I encourage folks to go, you know, much has been made about the fact that we have put forth a 22 page plan, but I call that comprehensive. So I encourage folks to take a look at our full plan at www.joebiden.com slash Black America. Um, but a key part of that plan is about wealth creation and yes, economic justice. And so we have, um, we talk about housing and ensuring that uh, under a Biden presidency that we are doing things like re rethinking ways that how we think about credit and that Vice President Biden will instruct credit bureaus to take into account other things that are currently not taken into account on credit. So, you know, maybe your payment history on things like your phone bill, all these other things that sometimes are not taken into account given on, you know, give or take where you are um, in terms of credit. We talk about his first time home buyers program. 
We talk about um, an advanceable tax credit that is available under that program and advanceable meaning that you don't have to wait until you file your taxes to get it. It is available right then and there and now. But we also really talk about in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, um, how African Americans, specifically African American small business owners have been hit hardest. African American mm -hmm. small business owners are folks that are um, more likely to own businesses and services that are people to people direct services, whether that's restaurants, whether those are care services, whether that's salons. And those are things that we know right now, I mean, you can look at wherever state you're in, or I'm in the District of Columbia, you talk about phase one or phase two, in some instances, restaurants will not be able to have people seated in their establishments until phase three or phase four. So um, our plan really speaks to one ensuring that we are sh shoring up small businesses. We talk about rebuilding the backbone of this country, and we believe that small businesses are a key part of that. Um, creating a true small business fund. So ensuring that the majority of monies in that fund go to small businesses that have less than 50 employees. The majority of African American owned businesses have less than 50 employees when it comes to the PPP program. Um, we have seen a, another reiteration of that program of those funds go out. There will inevitably be another reiteration of those funds and probably maybe two or three more reiterations because we know the devastation um, that, has gripped this, that has gripped the country uh, is not going away tomorrow. So ensuring that small businesses, particularly minority owned businesses are pushed to the front of that program. Re retooling and instituting a work sharing program. This is something the Obama Biden administration um, pioneered, something that we have encouraged the Trump administration to do, but something absolutely that the Biden, that a Biden administration would take on. So there are a couple different pieces, but I will say we talk expansively about small businesses um, at the front of our proposal because it is something that in conversations that we have with a number of people, we've heard that has not gotten enough attention that there are specific things that the Small Business Administration and the federal government could be doing that they have not done over a number of um, different presidencies. And then, you know, our policy folks and Vice President Biden thought that we could be leaders on. So we encourage people to take a look at it. Give us your feedback, okay? We're not purporting to always get it 110% right, but these documents are foundational documents for how Vice President Biden will govern. These are foundational documents for actual, for actual Biden administration policies. And frankly, I think that speaks volumes. The last point I'll say on this is um, we are, and this isn't a point I came up with, the civil rights community told me this, we are the first um, Democratic nominee to put out a comprehensive plan for Black America in a general election. Usually these kinds of plans come in a primary where people are jockeying for the African-American vote and then folks make a general election pivot to go talk about some other things. Our general election pivot includes Black voters. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I've got to ask on the VP topic, and I'm not expecting you to make news <laughs> today, but how important is it and how sort of where is it in your factoring and the campaign's um, thought process, how black voters react or how much how much appeal they find in the VP pick? Look, Vice President Biden, I have, I have said, um, and what I'm about to say is what I just told a reporter earlier today, uh, and what I will tell anyone who asks me about this, that if there's one thing Vice President Biden knows a lot about, it is um, the vigorous selection process uh, for a vice presidential nominee pick. He has obviously been through this process. And so we are running a very vigorous, thorough process. We have established a, co a committee to kind of shepherd this work. and we need to let the process play out. Vice President Biden, though, um, the person that will become his eventual, you know, running mate will be someone that is simpatico, as he likes to say, that can mirror the relationship that he and President Obama had. Somebody that is ready to govern on day one. Someone that he can um, give presidential authority to, much like President Obama gave to him. Because the tasks before a Biden administration, um, if Vice President Biden is elected, will be large and it will be something he will have to share with his governing partner. So could that be a black woman? Yes. Uh, do, do we know who, which woman it will be? No, we will have to wait and see. Okay, thank, but we thank have you. heard, I want to underscore though, we have heard the concerns of voters across the country. We have heard the concerns of black women, many of, many of which who have written letters saying they would like to see an African-American woman running mate. We've heard the concerns of the Latino community. Like we hear you. Um, we are going to let this process play out. So I read your phenomenal book over the weekend, um, and first, congratulations oh, on the book. You. 
Um, one of the themes that you explore in the book is you talk about all the many, I think you said 150 factions, but there are pro sometimes it feels like thousands of factions within the Democratic Party. And it often seems like now, how do all of these these factions influence the apparatus of the of the Democratic Party. And so you talk about this beautifully in the book. And it's a question that, you know, we ask a lot here at Third Way and, and Democrats generally. So having worked for two candidates who seem to represent two ends of the spectrums of the party, um, what's the message that will resonate with all of these factions? And what's the campaign strategy for bringing all of these folks under the tent? So one, I'll say two things. So first, I think the calculation in this election is a calculation that is different than um, that has confronted any other Democratic nominee in the past. It's very different and it's very distinct to this moment that we're in. One, because we're in the midst of a global pandemic that has gripped the world, but it's crippling America. We had now, you know, President Trump did not cause the coronavirus. He did not, you know, you know, he didn't cook it up in a lab somewhere. That's not what we're saying. He's not the cause of it, but the public health crisis that has ensued since um, the coronavirus has gripped this country, followed by the economic crisis that has ensued. We are on the cusp of 100,000 deaths in this country. Um, that is squarely laid at the feet of President Trump. Like that is a failure of leadership and that is a cost of complacency. I'm still trying to figure out what the Trump administration was doing in January or February. And so because we are in the midst of a global pandemic, there are just things that, you know, our campaign has to think about, not just in the midst of a general election campaign, but in terms of what will Joe Biden do as president that are very different than any other nominee? Like we are experiencing great depression level economic devastation that it will take um, a monumental efforts from the federal government to fix and help build back better. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, much different than, people like to make a lot of comparisons to 2016, but much different than 2016 is that voters across the country have felt and seen for themselves the effects of a Donald Trump presidency. We are not just talking about theories at this point. We are talking about actual jobs, actual lives, actual experiences that voters across the country, white, black, Latino, Native American, Asian American, Pacific Islander, indigenous and otherwise have had under this president. So this is not theoretical at this point. We truly believe that this campaign is and this election is a refer this election is a referendum on Donald Trump and the, the type, the way he has governed and what he has and has not, frankly, delivered for the American people. So understanding that, we walked into this primary with what, 24 people running for president, I give or take, you know, a billion at times, it seems like. Um, every single one of those candidates understood that their opponent in this race was Donald Trump. While there were various candidates jockeying for the role of the Democratic nominee, there was only one opponent that we all had, and it was Donald Trump. And so now I think the difference is, even some of you know, my extremely progressive friends and organizations, they understand that Donald Trump is their opponent. Um, the question is, how do we work together? And like, what is the message that helps us that, that we can all coalesce around? Well, one, Donald Trump, but two, a bold vision and plan for the future that not only says that, you know, Donald Trump has been bad and this is how he has not kept his word, this is how he has devastated um, our country, but a message that says, and this is what I will do as president. This is my vision. This is my plan for criminal justice reform, for the economy, for education. This is how I plan to put more teachers back to work. This is how I plan to create more jobs. This is how I, I, I plan to keep, to help you keep food on the table and money in your pocket. And that is how, you know, those are the kinds of messages that we are really um, you know, anchoring our campaign in. And that is how we have approached our progressive engagement. And so I like to say we're doing it with meticulous surgical precision. We are going group by group, if you will, for our progressive friends, having conversations. Sometimes they are policy first conversations and political. Sometimes they're political first conversations and policy, but it's really about where do we align and then how can we expand upon that alignment? Sometimes that alignment looks like um, a policy plan. So it's Vice President Biden adopting uh, Senator Warren's bankruptcy policy or him expanding on a plan for making public colleges and universities tuition free for students whose families earn up to or less than $125,000. Sometimes that's policy. Sometimes our alignment though looks like um, engaging in grassroots organizing with Indivisible, an organization that has endorsed us and uh, an organization that we are really using to bolster our state efforts. So it looks a little bit different, but 
either way, we have to come to the table and say, this is, this is our plan. We need you. We want you. We cannot do this without you, young people, people of color, our progressive friends. And how can we work together to make this happen? And that's how we're doing it. You, we won't always make everybody happy. We won't get it right 110% of the time. But no one can say that we are not actively trying. Thank you for that. Um, so we're in the middle of a pandemic. No one's ever had to, at least in recent, you know, maybe 100 years, had to campaign and wage a presidential campaign during a pandemic in the, in the age of social distancing. How are, you, how are you all adjusting and pivoting? And how is, how is Vice President Biden reaching uh, voters around the country at this time? I would argue we have adjusted very quickly to our new normal. Um, so while we would love to be actively out there on the campaign trail, seeing voters in person, we are going to let science lead us and we are not, we're going to go back out when it is safe for the vice president, for our, our traveling team and for the voters. But in the absence of being in person, we are connecting virtually and connecting virtually does, does not mean that we are not reaching actual people. So Vice President Biden and Dr. Biden have been doing virtual travel days. Last week, he went to Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Biden has been to Pennsylvania. She went to Denver the other day. She was in Detroit doing a round table. Vice President Biden was in Florida. So we are gonna continue to prioritize these virtual travel days. Other ways we're reaching voters are round tables. So we're doing round tables. We are doing, you, you all might've seen a round table Vice President Biden did about two weeks ago with governor. So it was Governor Whitmer and Governor Murphy um, that joined in this conversation with Vice President Biden about the coronavirus pandemic and uh, how governors are leading and the lack of help that they're getting from the federal government and really talking about the issues that Vice President Biden plans for the future. So we have seen a lot of success in our virtual events. We, we did a, a round table um, with Chef Jose Andres uh, last week that we partnered with Verizon and Yahoo, and they had it on their platforms and they posted it and put it out. But we're also really engaging our surrogates. So our young Americans team, which today, what time is it? Uh, coming soon, we are launching our young Americans, um, our official branding. It's not out yet, so I'm not gonna scoop it because we worked really hard on it. So I'm gonna let the people do their rollout. But last week we did a, a, round, a brunch, if you will, with Andrew Yang and Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist from Michigan. So those are some of the ways that we are trying to reach people in this virtual world. Today, Vice President Biden did do an in-person interview with Dana Bash at CNN. It was a socially distant interview outside his home in the driveway. So you're going to start seeing him um, engage in more of these things down the line. So it is really an adjustment to a, a new normal. And I hope we get back out on the actual campaign trail soon. But in absence of that, the virtual, the virtual campaign trail isn't too bad. Um, thank you. So we're getting questions in, and again, a reminder to the audience to use the Q&A feature to ask questions. Um, from James Clark, we hear constantly that the primary issue to voters is health care, availability, and cost. How does this issue get expressed in, within the campaign, and what are the key messages on this issue being voiced, especially to the African-American community, given all of the disparities uh, of COVID-19? I mean, I think it's a really important question. Look, um, a, there is Harvard has a poll out and they do some of what I would argue some of the most extensive polling on young people across the country and they've done it consistently for the last 21, 22 years. And in that polling that just recently came out about a month and a half ago, the number one issue for young people in this country was health care and the number two issue was the economy. That was before we were gripped in the midst of the, this pandemic. So it's even more exacerbated. Right now, even in the midst of this global pandemic, Donald Trump is in court with Republican attorney generals trying to take health care away from millions of Americans. That's something Joe Biden mentioned in every interview. That's something we are actively messaging to, to folks in the states. Um, you talk about the health disparities. The coronavirus pandemic has done nothing but shine a flashlight and a magnifying glass onto this, all of the disparities that already existed uh, within our system. As Vice President Biden likes to say, the Band-Aid has been ripped off, and now we truly have an opportunity to go in and really give structural change and fix some of these systemic issues that have long since been pervasive, including in our healthcare system. We have a healthcare plan we're very proud about that we are more than, that we are, we have been running on since people told us it wasn't popular to run on it, okay? And we want a primary on it and we'll be running on it in the general election. And that is Biden care. That's building on the success of Obamacare, but also 
shoring up some of the gaps, ensuring that folks who live in places right now whose governors have denied them Medicaid expansion or state legislatures have denied it to them, they are automatically enrolled on our plan. People who don't have to lose their um, private insurance under our health care plan, all of these things. We are lowering drug costs across the board, lowering costs, period, across the board. Uh, really giving real relief for folks. There should not be a question if people are able to access care in 2020, but there is for so many people across this country. So our health care plan shores that up and you can get it passed. Okay, so another question from the audience. Last week, Perry Bacon Jr. wrote on 538 how Biden could be the most liberal president in modern U.S. history. What is we your take agree, on Perry. that? <laughs> we agree. Look, we have people did not believe when we were saying this in the primary, but a Joe Biden presidency would be one of the most the most progressive presidency in generations. It absolutely would be. And how do I support that statement? Look at the proposals that he's putting that he's put forth even before the pandemic. Now we are going to need some like FDR level um, overhauling in terms of what we, the kinds of services and relief that the federal government provides. And we are actively putting together plans um, to ensure that we are in a place to do that uh, if and when Joe Biden is elected president. So we have a, a jobs plan um, that we've been talking about. You'll see it more explicitly in the coming weeks, specifically what that means for um, black folks and Latino voters and women and young people because we are, we are really dealing with something very serious here. But I will tell you that, you know, we also believe that Vice President Biden um, has experience in doing this. He managed the $800 billion Recovery Act. That was his project. That was his baby that Vice President Biden, pardon me, that uh, President Obama delegated to Vice President Biden. And I would argue he came out with flying colors. So like he delivered for the people. So we have a track record of a person here who has who, who knows what it's like to have to sit down and have those tough conversations and make those hard decisions uh, for the American people. So we, we agree with Perry. I read it and I was like, yes, Perry, thank you. Someone, <laughs> someone has heard what we said. Y'all gonna read Perry Bacon. <laughs> Another question. So will there be debates? Uh, do you know? And if so, how will they happen? Uh, you know, we, we would love, okay, Vice President Biden would love to debate Donald Trump, he can't wait to get on the debate stage with him because we believe that Joe Biden is the opposite of everything that Donald Trump stands for in terms of leadership, the ability to govern, in terms of empathy. Uh, so we can't wait to get on the debate stage. We'll have to see. Uh, I don't know if you know President Trump is concerned about debating Joe Biden, but Joe Biden sure can't wait to see Donald Trump in a debate. All right, and the, another great question on here. How can we help reach African-Americans? Well, really all voters, um, but particularly African-Americans who do not have access to Wi-Fi, internet, or computers. Well, we agree. So to be clear, just because we're in a virtual environment does not mean we are not gonna have a robust mail operation. So I, I do think that the pandemic has thrown um, a lot of conventional wisdom right into question because no one has had the campaign in a pandemic before, but there are some things that, you know, that don't change. Like people are still getting their mail. Uh, let's just hope, you know, the Republicans don't try to gut the post office. So let's just say the post office here, but people are still getting their mail. So we are going to still have to communicate to voters via mail. Uh, folks are still watching television. So we will be communicating to voters via television. Uh, people are still, they still have phones. So we still have to, you know, use these things to pick up the phone and call folks. So we are doing, um, we are phone banking folks right now. We will be, we will be doing all of those things. Um, but there is a, I mean, again, this pandemic has shined a, 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 a spotlight and a magnifying glass of disparity. The issues as it relates to broadband and the lack of access in urban communities of color, but also rural communities is, is, is something that we absolutely have to confront. And it is it will be a part of our plan uh, for a Biden administration, because the reality is if this is the way of life for the next year and a half, think about these young people who are having to do distant learning at home. What if you don't have a computer? What if you don't have Wi-Fi? What if, I mean, there are all these what ifs. And again, if we're saying that regardless of a child's zip code or socioeconomic status, they should be able to access a good, quality education, um, then we're, we're not living up to that right now in the United States of America as it relates to the distant learning. So we have to do something to make sure we sure that up. 
Great. So as you talk about, and, and you actually talk a little a bit about this in the book, it's one of the major themes, the need to empower activists and activists like yourself and create pathways, positions of power for people from vulnerable communities. How does the campaign um, plan to continue this partnership? How does uh, Vice President Biden uh, plan to continue this partnership with folks once he's uh, back in the White House? So I will. So first I'll note that um, I know every everybody always likes to call me an activist. Al Sharpton called me one this weekend and I'm like, I, I don't actually view myself as an activist. I just like to say I played one on TV uh, for a little while because, you know, I feel like the activists are the folks that have truly put their bodies on the line, like the Brittany Pagnett Cunningham, the DeRay McCatson, the Tef Coe's of the world. Um, so I would say that the way that we, so I go back to our policies. And so the way, the, the way that a policy proposal comes together um, in a Biden campaign is that, you know, our policy people get together. We know what the vice president Biden believes and has said, but we also want to make sure we check with some folks. So we go out and we get a mirrored, uh, we get feedback from everywhere and everybody. So for our criminal justice reform plan, for example, we chatted, we talked with Campaign Zero, um, the arm that came that was created by uh, Dre McKesson and Brittany Packnett Cunningham and Sam Sinyawe. We chatted with Liz Ryan from um, the does juvenile justice work. We talked with the folks from the Brennan Center. We talked with, you know, system involved folks. We talked with formerly system involved folks. And, and, and that is really the way that we um, that we inform our policies on top of any engagement that the vice president himself has done. And so in a Biden administration, I think you can expect them to build off the um, Obama Biden administration uh, off of the public engagement model. And uh, I've had conversations with a number of folks over there, Valerie Darrett, um, Heather Foster, Stephanie Young. And I mean, they, their, their model was really constant and consistent engagement, ensuring that you are not just picking up the phone when you need something or when you want something or when you got a question, that you are constantly engaged with folks. And that is what we try to do on the campaign. I'm always on the folks about like, who are y'all calling today? Did you pick up the phone? Did you call? Y'all, if y'all have call scheduled, it's a problem. And so that is something that we obviously going into a general election in a, in a virtual campaign world, we have to just do even more of. Um, and that's something you can absolutely expect to be a hallmark of a, a Biden presidency. But I'll, I'll, I'll give y'all one thing that everyone on this line can connect with right now. I send out like a, a kitchen cabinet thing uh, every day. Now I'm doing it every day. Shout out to my special assistant, Nyala. She's making sure that it goes out. And if it ain't out by three, me and Nyala are gonna have an issue today. Uh, but I send this out and try to do it every day. And it's just an update about some things that are happening in the campaign, things Vice President Biden has done, maybe an interesting poll. And so we are sending, we, it's called a, it's a play on our dose of Joe. We have a dose of Joe that goes out widely to allies every day. And I kind of edit our dose of Joe and then send it out to my kitchen cabinet. So I encourage people, Okay, I want you to sign up for the kitchen cabinet. Just shoot me an email and the headline can say, add me to kitchen cabinet and we will get you added. My email is sstanders at joebiden.com. That's S-S-A-N-D-E-R-S at joebiden.com. Send it to me. You'll be connected. You can forward the kitchen cabinet. And it sounds small, but what people really want is information. And we have to do our best. And I'm, you know, Minyan Moore, I'm always tells me that I'm old school. She's like, you old school, giving out your email and sending out a, a, a newsletter. I, said, yes, I was going to say, you sure school. you want to do that? But okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, okay. That's not yeah. email. Just send me the thing, okay? And we will make sure you get the kitchen cabinet. But that's just one way that we are aiming to ensure that folks are connected to what we're doing. And then we can get feedback from folks. And then maybe an organization or a group of people somewhere <clears throat> are doing something really interesting that's pertaining to jobs or criminal justice reform or, or women that the campaign can partner with. So, <coughs> pardon me, y'all. I have allergies, not the coronavirus. These dang on flowers behind me. Um, so this is one way that we can connect. So send me the email. We will get y'all on the kitchen cabinet. I love that radical transparency. Um, question from Tina Walls. What's the infrastructure for debunking bad information on the web? And how are you communicating with black millennials and other young voters to push back on incorrect information and explain why they need to vote for Joe Biden and not sit out the election? So we have done a lot of work over the last um, couple months revving up and building our online community. And online communities are really important because that's where a lot of um, that that is that's kind of how things go. That's how things go get a virality to it. They go viral. You know, these people who are online are actively engaging in whatever space. So that's why when uh, the Ahmaud Arbery case uh, and the video surfaced, there was there's an online community of people 
that are tuned in and that care very much. So, and many of us are in like, I count myself in this online community that care about um, addressing police brutality in this country and police accountability. And so this is content that spoke to that community that they pushed and that they sent. I can't tell you how many times someone sent me, did you see this? And so we're doing the work of building online community um, similar to that about Joe Biden. And so we have something called the Soul Squad, um, where people can go to our website, www.joebiden.com slash soul squad. And folks have a question, well, how can I start a Facebook group that is viable? Mm -hmm. The Soul Squad will help you start one. We are literally connecting you with a digital organizer and someone from our digital team, depending on what it is you want, maybe somebody from our political team that helps you get your online community started. And then we have a liaison for you um, whose person, whose job it is to really liaison with these communities. So we're doing that you know, on Facebook and Twitter, especially where we're working to build some followings and online communities on places like Snapchat. It's a place where a number of young, some of the youngest um, young people are engaging in the midterm election. Snapchat registered, <coughs> pardon me, I need some water. Snapchat registered about 425,000 young people to vote. Okay, that's a lot of young people. We need to engage with them. So Vice President Biden himself has done some interviews on Snapchat. We're hosting a week, we're launching a weekly Snapchat show that starts tomorrow, actually, every Wednesday, Wind Out Wednesdays. I host it where I'm answering questions from young people that they've sent us a couple days before, and I record these videos, and then we put them out. And there, every, we've gotten questions about everything from our plan for historically black colleges and universities to our plan for healthcare to like, do you actually have a black agenda? Where is it? Where can I find it? What is in it? So um, these are just small ways that we're trying to connect with people, but this building online community so we have an online army is extremely important because in this election, we have to not only combat misinformation, disinformation from Russia, because it is in fact still happening, we have to combat it from the White House. And mm -hmm. our Republican friends who are putting these things out there that just are not true. And it is helpful if you have built a following online that can help call things out and bat things down as, as opposed to just a campaign calling it out. But we are actively engaged in monitoring this. Um, I know the DNC has built up uh, additional infrastructure to do this work. So it is, it is just something that's constantly you have to look at every single day. But we are really keyed into, even if we weren't in a virtual campaign world, building online community because so many things are happening online. We're building community in Reddit. Like Reddit is like the deepest bowels of the internet. We are going there. Um, so we've got a question from Mark Pacheco. The, the task force on climate change, um, and actually all the different various task forces that the, that the campaign has, how can leaders uh, on climate change get involved with that task force? And, and if there are other task forces, how can folks get involved with those? So the task forces um, that Mark is referring to are the task forces that our campaign and the Sanders campaign came together <clears throat> and, and around six different topic areas, so climate, is one of them. We've got one on education, one on the economy, one on criminal justice reform, one on health care. I feel like I haven't named six yet, but there's six of them. Um, and there are representatives from the Sanders um, orbit and representatives from the Biden orbit. And those task forces have been charged with putting together reports, frankly, that will be foundational documents for the platform drafting committee. And so these folks are coming together. They're putting together these policies that are like the best of both worlds. And then those policies are going forth to be given to the platform drafting committee. And then largely, then larger the DNC platform committee that will eventually become the platform of the Democratic Party going into um, this convention. There will be a convention, ladies and gentlemen. Just don't know what it'll look like. I don't have any news to break for you on that, but there we are having a convention. And so if folks are interested in getting engaged with the task forces, um, while we are not taking new membership on the task forces, all of our task force membership has been encouraged to, you know, reach out to for folks and source information. And um, I can give you, you all have my email, send me an email, just do a different, do a different headline, if it's a climate task force or whatever, and I can forward you to the correct person that can help connect you with that task force. But we are, some task forces are doing listening sessions with a couple different folks. Um, but I want to be clear that, that if, that these task forces are not the only opportunity that folks will have to give input on these foundational policies that will become the drafting, that will become the platform of the Democratic National Committee and, and, and that of which Joe Biden. Like there'll be multiple opportunities. The platform committee will be still doing, we're planning to still host regional <clears throat> listening sessions, if you will, um, similar to what happened in 2016. They just all might be virtual. 
So I encourage people to reach out to the task force membership, uh, but know that this is, this is if, you, if, you don't, if you don't happen to connect with the task force membership, this is not the last opportunity to have these conversations and have input on these policies before they are like baked in stone. Excellent. So one more question. Well, I think we have time for two more questions. So I'll start. Um, how is the campaign countering the significant investments that Donald Trump has made in digital outreach? I love this question. You know, there is a, I believe that there's a kind of misconception or as Senator Sanders would say, there's just a, a fundamental misunderstanding um, of what we are doing online and what the Trump campaign is doing online. We outspent the Trump campaign in March uh, online. We outspent them. You can, you can, you can check it. We outspent them. We are raising, we, we raised only what a million dollars less than um, Trump raised uh, last month. <clears throat> and that is just from the DNC and the Biden for president campaign accounts. We have yet to even talk about our joint, what our joint fundraising agreement with the DNC itself has raised because that is a separate raising entity. And so we, we are counting them online very well. I would note that we put out a video yesterday and we got four tweets from president trump talking about the video that we put out about him golfing meanwhile uh we are on the cusp of a hundred thousand uh dead americans given this coronavirus so we think we're doing well obviously there's we can do more so we are getting innovative we've hired a number of folks from different campaigns to come in and kind of bolster what we've been doing online whether it's the online communities piece, but also how we are investing, what kind of ads we're running, what kind of digital pieces we're putting out there in the universe. And we've seen uh, a good return on that investment and we look forward to more. But, you know, we outfit that man in March. So we seem to be, you know, on pace. All right, so I, I want to, I know we're running out of time, but I want to end by asking you something that you actually raised in the book. You say, the party is too concerned with telling voters how they can keep the American experiment intact without focusing on what the people are actually saying and what we want to change about our democracy. As you have been, you know, thinking about and working on this campaign, how are you making sure that the campaign and the messaging and Vice President Biden is really speaking to what people want to change about our democracy? by listening to people. I think it's an excellent question and it's by listening. So many times throughout this primary process, we would, uh, I would see things that were percolating from the Twitterati and that's what I like to call the Twitterati. You know, those are the Beltway <laughs> folks on, on Twitter that they think that like all, all, all the things that happen in the world are only on this section of the internet. And they would say, oh, well, the campaign needs to respond to this and Joe Biden should be doing this. And, he's not going to do well because x y and z and, and the the entire like realm of their um position was came from the internet came from twitter or maybe what they saw on instagram i doubt snapchat but it was really what they were saying on twitter we prioritize talking to real people mm. vice president biden spending time with real voters there is not a place that we would go across the country where we weren't having a round table or a clutch not just with like leadership from the community, but like actual small business owners. Now, because we're in a virtual world, Vice President Biden is picking up the phone and he is calling firefighters and nurses and frontline folks. He's talking to small business folks. We are having, we're doing virtual rope lines where he can get that one-on-one -on -one interaction that he would usually get at a rally after, after his rally on the rope line. He's getting that now virtually and folks are getting that. We are prioritizing talking to real people and then, <clears throat> pardon me, taking their feedback turning that into policy. You know, um, Vice President Biden spoke to President Trump uh, at this point, it was a number of weeks ago. Uh, it was widely publicized when it happened. And he used his time in speaking to President Trump to amplify what he had heard from the folks who are on the front lines of fighting this virus, from the nurses and the doctors and the EMT workers and the firefighters. He used his time to talk about what he had heard from the young woman he spoke with that worked at the grocery store, that she doesn't have proper PPE, but people are still expecting her to go to work. He used his time to talk about, you know, what, what he had heard from the governors, what types of things that not only he would be doing if he were president, but, you know, things that will need to happen looking going forward. And so that is how, that is just who Joe Biden is. He is the most empathetic person I think I've ever met in my, you know, short little life. Um, but he is also someone that listens and then takes what he hears and then turns that into action. And I frankly would really, really enjoy a president that did that. So that is why I am here. I'm doing everything that I can.
to make Joe Biden the 46th president of the United States of America, because I think it's what the people need. Absolutely. And with that, thank you so much, Mr. Simone, for thank making you. time for this. On behalf of myself and my colleagues at Third Way, we are so appreciative of you taking the time to answer these questions. And for folks uh, in the audience, um, look out for the next event in this series, mm -hmm. which will be taking place next week. And thank you again, Simone. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, everyone.